The National Theatre's production of War Horse beamed attention on Michael, and without wanting to embarrass him, I think it's fair to say that he has become one of our national treasures. <laughs> but that status comes as no surprise to people in this room. It wasn't the result of one book, or even two, or three, or four, or five, or ten. Michael has been passing on his passion for reading and for stories for decades. Generations of children, their teachers, and their parents have been transformed by his words and his commitment. Michael is an evangelist for stories and reading, taking every opportunity to explain why they matter. Michael's ability to move, entertain, and inspire people to think informs not just his writing and his storytelling, but all the other tasks he takes on. His efforts were probably most visible during his period as children's laureate, when as the official spokesperson for children's books in the UK, he reminded us regularly of the importance of stories from the beginning to the end of life. And he's right. The emerging discipline of evolutionary literary theory teaches that we have survived as a species thanks to our ability to tell stories. Rather than letting their young make mistakes and be exposed to danger, our distant ancestors used storytelling to communicate accumulated knowledge, recent and past. This so-called called, uh, cognitive revolution occurred some 70,000 years ago, but storytelling continues to help us make sense of the world and pass on knowledge in ways that children can remember. Now, I know this because as a professor of English literature, this is what I study professionally. I also know that the passion for reading is being diluted by other ways of encountering stories and by the sheer volume of entertainment available. And genuinely, I am no Luddite. I watch TV. I love films. I, use, I read on Kindle. I, you know, I, I do hours in front of a screen. But I do also feel passionately that we have to preserve the place of reading in children's lives so that they absorb as many stories as possible in what is probably their purest form, that relationship between the word on the page and the child that goes in and nobody else is mediating it. Here on here, my colleagues and I have watched the literary knowledge of even committed students at a top university decline. These students believe they have a passion for reading, which is why they choose to read English. But many struggle to finish the novels that have enthralled previous generations. It's not because novels are too difficult or too long, but they have not developed the reading stamina. They don't have the strategies for getting to the end of some of the books. So as a consequence, they lack a literary frame of reference when they arrive. They can't recognize, don't really understand what they you know, intuitively, genres and conventions. They're unfamiliar with the characters and phrases, openings and endings of classic texts that they need to interpret the works they study. So this is exciting when Michael asked me to join him on developing the Oxford Treetops Greatest Story series. Working with Michael and all the brilliant writers and illustrators who came together to make these books was fun. It was a great privilege. In fact, initially it seemed like a kind of parlor game, and we made lists and exchanged favorites and argued about which stories truly are the greatest. It was fun, but it was also something we both cared passionately about. Um, we cared about it passionately, and we cared about it professionally in our two different spheres. This series was our chance to help protect the ocean of the stream of stories. And I do, I genuinely feel confident that children and young people who encounter great works from the past in this series will have the frame of reference they need to succeed, whatever they do in later life. I mean, these, the, we have not <laughs> down or um, diminishing in the stories. They're brilliantly newly retold, and they'll give hooks into some great works for, for young people later on. But that's enough for me. Um. First of all, thank you, Kim. The reason we asked Kim to join us in this great project um, was because at its heart what we wanted was a collection that had integrity and understanding. So it's not about just putting out any old stories and hope they work. It's about someone who understood the breadth and depth of our language and our literature from earliest times up to the present day, almost. And then to pass on the best of that retold by fantastic writers and 
by wonderful illustrators. I don't see any point in spending my quarter hour, 20 minutes, talking to you about the importance of writing, reading for young people. I just think I should tell you a story, a journey, a, you might call it a, a reader's progress, a writer's progress, as in the pilgrim's progress, towards uh, my understanding and love of books and literature. But I will start you at the beginning, where it all should start. Um, I was lucky, I had a mother, of course, uh, but I was very lucky in my mother. A, she was very kind. She was also exceedingly beautiful, well, you can tell. <laughs> and she was an actress. So when she read, she had a wonderful, wonderful voice, and she could play all the parts. She also loved just a, a rather narrow selection, when I think back, of poets. It would have been Macefield, it would have been Kipling, it would have been Walter de la Mer, Wordsworth, Shakespeare. And she loved stories. And she would sit on our bed at night, my brother Peter and myself, and she would tell us these stories, read us these stories, <coughs> read us these poems. We loved it. Why did we love it? Because she was doing it. <coughs> we didn't understand half she was reading us, but we loved listening to it. And very early on, my brother and myself understood the music of language before we almost ever understood the language. Also, we caught the passion that she had for what it was that she was passing on to us. Is that lovely moment, that quarter of an hour when she was with you? And consequently, aged five, when I walked down this, the road to my first primary school, St. Matthias in the Warwick Road, um, I loved stories. But then I walked into school. And life changed. Um, and it changed very much for the worse. Because then, and I'm talking about I was about 1943, about 1950, less, under 1950, 43, 43, what's 43 plus 5? 48. Um, in those days, and most of you in this room will not really know what I'm talking about, but schools were full of fear. Um, fear of punishment for just about everything, um, behavior, and most of all, a failure. Um, failure came very obviously when you failed to answer a question properly. Um, when you failed to learn a poem properly, when you failed to spell right or your handwriting wasn't, there was detention, there was punishment. Everything, suddenly words became this enemy, just a complete enemy for me, uh, and, and a fear. I spent a lot of time standing in the corner, wishing I was at home, ran away once or twice, which was fun. Um, but the whole light that had been on the love of stories uh, was almost wiped out, but not quite. There was a little flicker left, um, which sustained me right the way through a bad teacher at that school, who was a bit wicked, to be honest with you, in the sense that she reinforced a difficulty rather than encouraged the other. And I did have, though, one wonderful teacher at that school, and you do not forget the wonderful ones, as you know. She was a music teacher, and she let me um, sing in the little choir that we had. And she was the, also the person who gave me the main part in a play of The Owl and the Pussycat Went to Sea, in which I sang, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, to a tune that she'd made up. And I felt wonderful. And I still love that, that poem. I still love her. Then I went to another school, same thing, quite a lot of tight stuff. Had one good teacher, um, because he knew, he could see when I was about 15, that all I wanted to do in my life was play rugby. So he said to me one day, and when I was having kind of a tutor's interview, he said, Michael, you have to learn in life there's something else besides rugby. And he lent me his book of Wordsworth poems. He said, Michael, please read these. Bring me the book back at the end of term. I don't want to discuss it with you. I just want you to read this book. Perhaps you try one poem a day, but bring it back to me. But don't, let's talk about it, just do it. He said, one thing would help, is if you find the words on the page, and I think you do, a bit difficult. 
speak it out loud. Tell it to yourself out loud. Try to hear the music and the words. And I thought, music, music. And that took me back to my mother. After a series of mishaps, I became a teacher and found myself in a primary school. Could you put up your hands if you teach in a primary school? I had the most wonderful head teacher. Any head teachers here? Well, that was not enough. <laughs> and they should be here, all of them. Anyway, this wonderful head teacher, she was what's called Mrs. Skiffington, never forgotten her. Mrs. Skiffington came into our class one day, and I was in a mobile classroom. I don't know why they call it mobile, they never move, but I was in this <laughs> mobile classroom teaching my year sixes. And uh, she'd gone around all the classrooms, and she'd and, and she gone into every one. She was kind of mad and wonderful, and she said, um, she said um, I had this wonderful idea in the bath last night. Um, so it was in front of the children, for goodness sake. <laughs> and um, yes, yes, yes. She said, stop what you're doing, stop what you're doing. Everyone now is telling a story, reading a story in the whole school. That's all I want to happen. From three o'clock to half past three, every afternoon, we read a story, we read a story. Get on with it, Michael, get on with it. She was like that, and out she went. So I had been reading, uh, back to my children at home, a book which I'd grown up on called The Just So Stories, The Elephant's Child. So I got out The Elephant's Child, and I read it to the children, and I read it with the same passion my mother had read to me. And I noticed that there was this stillness and there was this quietness. And I thought, this is just one of the most wonderful moments of teaching I've ever had, because we were all together lost in this story. Bell went at the end, and I went on doing this and doing this. And then one day I started a book. Uh, I won't tell you what it is, but it had, in the title, it had Dump. Um, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. Anyway, I started it. And in the first chapter, it's a book which is great, but it doesn't get going very fast. I tried, I tried the first chapter, and I looked around, and they were all looking out the window, picking their noses, as was their wont. They were year sixes, you know. And I thought, read it with more, with more commitment, come more. So I knew it. I thought I liked it. Anyway, it didn't work. And I went back home to my wife, who's also a teacher, and I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I've just begun this book. The children don't like it. And she said, well, don't go in there tomorrow and bore them, because you've done that once already. If it isn't working, it isn't working. It may be just not the book for them. Go in there, but before you go in, make one up. Don't have the book between you and them. Make one up. You're a pretty good liar. Just, 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 just <laughs> make one up. So I lay there that night and I, I made up a story, um, which I thought was all right. Said to my class the next day, you just tell you, story now. I'm not going to go on with the book we started yesterday. Typical year six response. Oh, sir. <laughs> I said, I don't care what you think. You're going to hear this story. I've stayed up all night making it up, and you've got to hear it. <laughs> and then I gave them this story, and for the first five minutes, it was looking out the window, and I thought, this isn't going to work, and there's that awful sinking feeling, and if you're a teacher, you'll know all about it. This isn't working. It's not working. I want to get out of here. I want to die. <laughs> anyway, I went on. I persevered, and the wonderful thing was, so after about 10 minutes, everything changed about the whole way they listened. And I got this terrific feeling that this is the best way of telling a story. Tell it from here. Tell it because you mean it. It wasn't a very good story, but I meant every single word of it. And they caught that. They caught the fact that I, this was not a school thing. This was me telling them something that I cared about. And a brilliant thing happened. Bell went at half past three. I hadn't finished it, and there was this, oh, sir, and I thought, yeah. <laughs> when I was little, I got a lot of confidence from something which would be very disapproved of now. It was for a series called Classics Illustrated. Um, hands up if you know what I'm talking about. These are wonderful things. They're like, um, I think they're American, aren't they? The American? Um, they, they, they were books about this shape. Um, with pictures all over and little bubbles for the speech, and it was of the great novels of the world. You see War and Peace in about 60 pages of pictures. And then I could tell my stepfather, I've read War and Peace. <laughs> and he quite liked that. But also I got the story. I knew then about Russia and Napoleon and 1812. That's why I first discovered all these things. And later on I read War and Peace, a book. And that's how it happens. This Seed corn, which you people are all doing every day of your lives, and which I hope this series will help with. 
But at the end of the day, what do we, what do we want? We want these children to grow up enriched, um, more aware of the world around them, of themselves, about relationships, about other cultures, about where we fit, how it works. Well, where is the best place to get this knowledge and understanding? It is from a book, and I think I know why now, after all this time. With a book, you have this strange code, this print, which some writer person has done, and some publisher person has put there. But it is nothing until the reader reads it. Once the reader brings his or her imagination to it, that's when the words come alive. And because of that effort of imagination, what seems to happen is that we see and hear the story much more deeply than you ever can in any other medium. And I've had a little experience of theatre and a film, and I'm still here to tell you that that extraordinary effort that a reader has to make is what is so, so important, because the author has left it to you to make of this what you will make of it. And none of us will make the same thing.